All of us are coming in with different things. And so, Lord, as we look at to your word, help us see Jesus and minister to us, Lord, we pray through him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so it's the prophets, and we covered a lot of judgment last time when we started off the book of Isaiah. And the sometimes the question to ask is, can a book with so much judgment contain any mercy and grace at all? And the answer, of course, is absolutely you know, when somebody first reads the book of Isaiah, um, they pick it up and they read it through for cover to cover for the first time, or do this with many of the books of the prophets, it can be pretty overwhelming to read about all the accounts of God's judgment, because there's all these nations, and God's got a word for each one of them, and we see the problem of sin so clearly portrayed. God points it out, clear that the wages of sin are death, right? Right? No matter where the sin originates, eventually that sin's going to be held to account in front of Almighty God. But in the overwhelming news of judgment is the message and the promise of God's grace. And we see that, of course, especially today when we look at the cross, because all sin does find an answer, as we've said many times. It's either found in the judgment of God upon the individual, or it's found in the judgment of God upon Jesus as he served in uh, Jerusalem as our redemptive sacrifice. Now, that's what we're really going to be looking at tonight. Of course, elements of God's judgment and grace can be seen in every prophetic book of the Bible, but especially in the book of Isaiah. God promised judgment, and we saw much of that in the book of judgment last week, but he also promised a redeemer. And one of the titles God takes to himself over and over again throughout the book of Isaiah is that he is the Lord, their redeemer. He himself is the redeemer of Israel. His work would be seen, that redemptive work, and the servant, the glorious servant that was yet to come, which is detailed here in the book of Isaiah. Now, just by way of review, because we are picking up somewhat two-thirds of the way through the book, uh, the first half of the book, the first two-thirds, I should say, is what's known as the book of of judgment, um, that's where the, the meat of all that judgment was found. That's where some of this can get a little bit overwhelming. Remember the first six chapters, the ministry begins. The nation was invited to reason with God. God had known their sins. God was promising things to come, uh, but that sin had to be dealt with. He called Isaiah to the ministry at that time. Isaiah had this glorious vision of God in his throne room, and God said, who's going to go for us? And Isaiah, of course, volunteered himself to go. What a privilege it is to partake in the, the calling of God, and that's what Isaiah signed up to do. He's commissioned to service. The next few chapters, 7 through 12, dealt with the Emmanuel prophecies. We think of Emmanuel, of course, as being Jesus, and he is, but the prophecy was first given in reference to the Assyrian uh, invasion of Israel and really of the southern kingdom as well. The Assyrian threat coming into the south is met with this promise of Emmanuel, God with us. God would maintain and keep the southern kingdom alive. He'd keep his Davidic promises alive. The Messiah was yet to come. How do they know that? Because God himself would dwell with them. The child would be born of a virgin first coming, but also promised that he'd one day have the government on his shoulder, second coming. He'd rule all the nations as God himself. Moved on from there to a rather lengthy section, chapters 13 through 24, God's burdens against the nations. All the surrounding neighbors of Israel, pretty much named one by one, are seen in their sin, but even the sin of the Jewish people is detailed as well. God promises his judgment that was coming both in the short term and in the long term. Uh, some of his judgment would be seen as the Assyrian army came in, and the Babylonians would later come in. And there would be physical judgment taking place on the earth, but part of that judgment was also looking forward to the time of the Great Tribulation, looking forward to the ultimate judgment as people are held to account for their sin in front of God himself. But the whole point of those chapters is that God shows himself sovereign not only over Israel, but God is sovereign over every nation of the earth. And because of that, Isaiah is overwhelmed, and that actually drives him to his knees in praise. And we saw a little praise break and chapters 25 through 27, and chapter 25 was Isaiah's personal song of praise. Chapters 26 through 27, he leads the nation in praise and worship of God. Takes us to the national woes and glory in chapter 28 through 35. There were very specific sins of the northern, kingdom, uh, northern and southern kingdom seen at this time. In that earlier section, the burdens against the nations, uh, primarily the focus was on the nation's of the earth, the surrounding neighbors of Israel, although there was 
uh, some attention given to Israel and to Judah themselves. But in this next section here, the focus is specifically on those no northern and southern kingdoms. Um, not only was there a sin seen and judged, but there was also a promise. And that promise was there would be a restored kingdom. These two kingdoms had fallen away from God's perfect plan. But God had a future plan for a restored kingdom, a perfect kingdom. And that's one of the things that's spoken of here. And then that first book concludes with what we can call a historical interlude. It's basically a repeat of many of the things that was written out for us in 2 Kings. When uh, Sennacherib, the Assyrian uh, leader, sent his army into the southern kingdom of Judah. They come and lay siege against Jerusalem. King Hezekiah is on the throne at the time, and uh, Sennacherib's uh, representatives are taunting God, taunting Hezekiah. Hezekiah takes those taunts, takes them to the Lord. The Lord gives a marvelous deliverance. Thousands of thousands of Assyrian soldiers are wiped out in a single night. Hezekiah, of course, gives praise to God, but he gets a little cocky at the same time. Uh, he... Uh, prayed God extended his life, but he used some of the time that he had to show off all of his wealth and the wealth of the nation to the Babylonians, which of course was not a wise thing to do considering Babylon would be the next nation to rise up against him. But that takes us through the first 39 chapters of Isaiah. At this point, it breaks and almost every scholar agrees that chapters 1 through 39 is one book, chapters 40 through 66 is another book. And depending on which scholar you read, some of them have different ideas of who wrote it. I firmly believe that Isaiah is the author of the entire book. But there's no doubt that the tone, the tenor, everything changes in this latter third. Uh, whereas the first 39 chapters have the primary theme of judgment. Uh, in this next section, it's the comfort and deliverance of God that moves to the forefront. Now, that's not to say that there's nothing in chapters 40 through 66 about judgment. There is. There's not to say that there's nothing about salvation in chapters 1 through 39. There is, of course, the promise of Emmanuel, the promises of the restored kingdom. That's all God's mercy. So that was all seen in the first 39 chapters. So it's not a huge, uh, just a, a definitive uh, all or nothing break here. It's just that these things weren't necessarily front and center. Now, in this sense, it's not too much unlike the change between the Old and the New Testaments of our Bible. Likewise, there's a similar division. There is roughly, what, or there are exactly 39 books of the Hebrew Scripture. There's 27 books of the Greek New Testament, just like the Book of Judgment, 39 chapters and 27 chapters of the Book of Comfort there. And while the law of God and judgment are front and center in our Old Testaments of our Bible, the grace and salvation of Jesus are front and center in the New Testament of our Bibles, there's still much to be seen in overlap between the two, isn't there? You know, you go back to the, the Old Testament, the grace of Jesus is clearly seen in many cases where we see the promises of God about the future Messiah. There's much to be seen about the salvation of God through Jesus Christ seen in the Old Testament. Some of what we see right here, we're going to go through some of those chapters tonight that speak so very clearly of Jesus. At the same time, there's no doubt about the message of God's judgment in the New Testament. We see some of that about uh, through Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse when he's talking about the great tribulation yet to come. Of course, the book of Revelation clearly shows God's judgment. That's in the New Testament. So we want to be careful about making a simplistic division between the two, writing off the Old Testament as being nothing about uh, grace. It's all about judgment. Oh, we don't have to pay attention to the God of the Old Testament, that sort of thing. No, there's much grace in the Old Testament. There's much comfort to be found in the Old Testament. In fact, the reason why God's comfort is so very comforting is because he's already painted the picture of his judgment. We know what we ought to have received, but when he tells us we don't have to receive that, that's amazing grace, and so we appreciate it all the more. All right, so let's look at the uh, book of comfort. We're going to have the promise for Israel. It's basically broken into three sections here. Uh, the promise for Israel, the comfort that's going to be coming. Uh, the person of redemption, and we'll spend uh, a bit of time there as it looks specifically to Jesus, the servant of God, and of course his final salvation and judgment, which is seen through the rest of the book. So we start off with the promise for Israel, uh, verse, uh, chapters 40 through 48, and chapter 40 is a song of comfort. And it starts off just exactly that way, 40 verse 1, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her. Is there any wonder we call this 
the book of comfort. That's what it titles itself, basically. And, and much of this chapter goes straight to the ministry of John the Baptist. Chapter 40, verse 3 is quoted in Matthew 3, 3. It's quoted in Mark 1, 2, quoted in Luke 3, 4, quoted in John 1, 23. John was that voice crying in the wilderness, just as what was prophesied here in Isaiah. Uh, the comfort, the good news of God's comfort needed to be proclaimed. That's what John the Baptist did. Now, John the Baptist, we know, was the last and actually the greatest of the prophets in that he prepared the way for the Lord Jesus himself. And in essence, to some extent, we can say that's a bit of Isaiah's role right here as well, right? Because he's reminding the people of the great God that they serve, they're reminding the people that God is coming for them, reminding them of the, 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 not only the judgment, but the grace of God that's coming for them, the God who knew them intimately, the God who remembered them specifically. All of that's seen here in chapter 40. Is he proclaiming this news? By the way, isn't this also somewhat, in essence, the same privilege that we have in the Great Commission? Both Isaiah and John the Baptist told the people of their day of the coming salvation of the Lord and the glory of God yet to come. And what is that if not the proclamation of the gospel? We get to tell people how Jesus has already come once. And we get to tell people how Jesus is going to be coming again. We get to tell them that just as it says here in chapter 40, that he's a God of creation who measures the waters of the ho in the hollow of his hand, verse 12. He's a creator God who sits above the circle of the earth, verse for, uh, 22 here of the work of God and his grace we get to tell them how God is the one who gives power to the weak verse 29 and he helps those who trust him by lifting them up with wings of eagles as we often quote in verse 31 of chapter 40 in our sin we're the weary ones but by trusting in Jesus as the Lord we're the strengthened in him that's the message that we proclaim that's the glorious privilege of the Great Commission. That's what we get to take part in as well. We get to proclaim it just like John the Baptist, just like Isaiah. So it starts with that song, and it goes into God's promise of his presence in chapter 41. God reminded the people that he's the first and the last in verse 4. And what does that sound like? Just as Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And God here contrasts himself with idols. He's going to do that several times throughout the, the rest of the book of Isaiah. But God reminded them that a statue had to be propped up. We see that in verse 7. You know, it's going to totter over this little bitty statue here. God doesn't have to get, uh, you know, worry about tottering over. He's not a statue like that, not a dead piece of wood or, or metal. No, he's the living God. And the living God can act upon the promises that he made to his people. That's the point there. In verse 8, you Israel, I've chosen you. I've taken you from the ends of the earth. You don't have to worry about me not being there. God had chosen them. He had a special covenant relationship with them, so they had no reason to fear. And one of my favorite verses from 41 comes from verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, obviously, that specific promise is for Israel, that's where the whole context is coming in. But the principle applies to the church, right? What reason do we have to fear in this world? God's never going to stop being our God. That's what he was telling Israel. I'm never going to stop being your God. I'm the living God. I'm not like those dead idols there. Jesus says he'll, he'll never cast us away. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He made a promise to us that where he is, we will be also. And we can trust him to keep it. Why? Because he's a living God Literally, right? He's resurrected from the grave. He's the living God. Again, throughout the rest of the chapter here, uh, God continues to contrast himself with the dead idols, reminding his people how he will act on their behalf. The molded images, as it says in verse 29, nothing but wind and confusion, not God. God is the, the living God. Now, verse, or chapter 42, uh, we start moving into the promised servant here. The servant of God is introduced at this point, though he won't be fully described for another several chapters to come. And there is a sense somewhat as we read through chapter 42 and glance through it that, you know, the servant of God could both be described as a specific individual as well as the nation of Israel. And that will come out specifically in other chapters that perhaps it could be the whole nation. In fact, modern interpretation from uh, Jews today take the servant to be a reference to the entire nation rather than a to a specific person, but 
many cases in Isaiah, it's clear that he's a person. Here in chapter 42, it's clear that he's a person. He's the one that brings forth justice from the Gentiles in verse 1. He was the one who was given as a light unto the Gentiles in verse 6. Because God had promised to send his servant, who very specifically acts in specific individual ways, God is to be praised. The enemies of Israel will be defeated. The entire nation will be redeemed. By the way, that takes us to chapter 43, because God is the Redeemer. All of chapter 43, some of chapter 44 here was God himself that would be the nation's Redeemer. He says it in verse 1, I have redeemed you. And again, all the way through this chapter, you find references to God saying he is the Redeemer. Verse 14, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. He takes that title to himself. He would be the one that would deliver them from the enemy. He would be the one to bring them back from east and west, verses 5 and 6. Of course, his promise not just to bring them back from Babylonian captivity, as we see in verse uh, 14, very clearly, I'll send to Babylon, I'll bring them all back down as fugitives. God, the Lord, is able to do this. But more than that, he would, what, in verse 25, completely blot out their transgressions. He would pour out his spirit even, on their descendants in chapter 44, verse 3. All the people will be known by the name of the Lord, chapter 44, verse 5. You say, well, this seems to be speaking about more than one thing, and it is. This is an example of dual fulfillment of prophecy. Because on one hand, we're talking about the return from the Babylonian captivity, but on another hand, we're talking about something that's so much greater than that. Because when they returned from Babylonian captivity, surely the spirit was not poured out on all of the descendants of Israel. No, that wouldn't come. Uh, we can see a, a portion of that in the day of Pentecost, but we'll see a greater portion of that during the millennial kingdom, right? So a dual fulfillment is prophecy, and we've seen this many times as we've gone through these prophets book by book, verse by verse. Isaiah is looking forward into the future, and all these things look to be the same thing because he's looking off of the distance, but it's like looking at a mountain range. And you look at a mountain range, some of those mountain pinks can be separated by, uh, by miles and miles and miles and miles, but it all looks the same off in the horizon and the distance. Well, this is the same idea here. Isaiah is looking off in the distance, and all appears to be the same thing, but it's actually separated here by, uh, in this case, thousands of years. Well, the rest of 44 takes us to the foolishness of idolatry and the restoration promised by God. The people had the opportunity to serve the Lord of hosts. So what purpose was there in serving dead, useless idols, as it says in Verse 9, all that image, that's all useless. It shall not profit. Why make a God that doesn't profit you anything? Why make a God that's out of a piece of wood or a piece of gold? That's a foolish waste of time. But instead, God would redeem his people out of those things. He would take them out of the land of idolatry back to the land of his promise and of his presence, as we see in verse 26. He says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. The cities of Judah, you shall be built. I will raise up her waste places. Specifically promising <laughs> long before they're ever taken into captivity. Dozens of years before they're ever taken into captivity. Saying, I'm going to bring you back again. Jerusalem's going to be built up again. God's preparing his people for all kinds of opportunities to see his grace well, chapter 45, we do talk about another servant of the Lord, but this time it's a specifically named servant, Cyrus. Not only is the servant of God spoken as the Messiah yet to come, but there's a more immediate servant, and that's Cyrus of the Medes and the Persians, specifically named by God in our text in chapter 44, verse 28, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. It says in 45, verse 2, uh, or verse 1, rather, to Cyrus, whose hand I have held, specifically called out by God. God can use any person and any part of the earth for his glory, which includes people from pagan lands even yet to be born. God had a plan for Cyrus, a pagan king, to be used for his glory, to bring his people back from captivity and fulfill his promises and his covenant to his people. It's amazing. Now keep in mind that Cyrus would not be known for another 200 years after Isaiah's writing which is one reason why liberal scholars have such a problem with the book of Isaiah. One reason they have a problem with the book of Daniel, because Daniel gets so specific about future prophecy as well. But Isaiah wrote it. What does that demonstrate? It says God is omniscient. It says God is the Lord of all history. God knows the history that hasn't been written yet. It's already written in his mind. He knows exactly what's going to happen. 
Well, from here uh, in part of chapter 25, we, or 45 rather, I should say, starting verse 14, uh, God is reaching out to the Gentiles. And uh, it's not, of course, just Israel that's invited to know the Lord, but it's the Gentile nations as well. If you look at that, it's the people of Egypt and Cush and the Sabaeans. So we're talking about people on the African continent that he's mentioning here in verse 16. They also would know that God, the creator of the heavens, is the creator of the, the Lord, or creator of the heavens and the earth, rather, verse 18. And the whole point is here, all the earth, all the ends of the earth are invited to look to him and be saved, verse 22. It says, all the Lord, in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel shall be justified, all shall glory. In fact, if we back up to verse 23, this will sound familiar. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out from my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ's glory is the Lord to the glory of God the Father, as it says in Philippians 2.10. It could be a little doubt that Paul was thinking of this passage right here when he wrote that. Chapter 46, he's calling Israel out of idolatry. Once more, he's addressing the foolishness of idolatry and tells the house of Jacob to leave it. As it says in verse 6, God, of course, could not be likened to an idol. God is far beyond idolatry. He's beyond those things. There is none like him in in all the earth. As he says in verse 5, you know, who are you going to liken me to? What are you going to make me equal with? You know, if you're going to try to make an image, how are you going to make an image of the almighty creator God? You can't do it. By the way, the only image we need of God is the one that he himself gave, and that's Jesus, his only begotten son, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creations, Colossians 1.15. All these other religions of the world, they spend so much time trying to make an image of God. He cannot be contained in that way. And so he reveals himself to us, since we can't grasp what he looks like. He reveals himself to us in Christ, which is one more show of his grace as part of the miracle of the incarnation. By the way, we might ask a question, why did his people turn to idols? Because here he seems to be speaking to Israel at this point. Why did the Jews turn to idolatry? We know through their their history many times that they did. Well, many reasons, but one is that they didn't know the work of the true God. Uh, They scoffed at the idea that God would be working on his own time frame. They had troubles. They wanted God to answer. They wanted God to answer according to their time frame, not his time frame. They wanted God to work according to their schedule, not his schedule. And that's one of the reasons God seems to affirm here in verse 11 that he will bring to pass his plan. These things would happen. He says, I've purposed it. I will do it. He, he affirms my plan is going to take place. He affirms in verse 14 that his salvation will not linger. See, when people don't want to submit themselves to the Lord, they don't want to wait upon God, they invent gods of their own imaginations. Why is that? Well, because people would rather have a butler than a king. They want somebody who's going to answer according to their ways, according to their time frame. And so we invent gods of our own imagination. People do the same thing today. They scoff at the idea of Jesus' return, or they scoff at the idea that they might actually have to answer themselves to God. So they invent gods of their own imaginations or decide to worship themselves as God because they want to be king. They don't want to answer to a king. But just like Israel, of course, one day they will know the truth. Jesus is the living God, and likewise, of course, his deliverance is not far off. Chapter 47, he gives a promise to judge Babylon, and of course, this fits perfectly within the section of God's comfort because it's the uh, captivity of Babylon uh, itself when they were conquered by the Medes and the Persians. That's what God would use to deliver his nation of Israel out of that land. So Babylon is not exempt from punishment, even though Babylon would be used by God. And echoes of chapter 47 reverberate through the book of Revelation, as we know, because the fall of future Babylon at the end of the Great Tribulation seems to be uh, have echoes in right here as well. Chapter 48, Israel is refined. It is redeemed. God had a purpose for Israel's punishment. That purpose would be completed. They were, as we see, just go down the list here in verse 4, they were obstinate. In verse 10, they were tested. In verse 20, but they would go forth from Babylon, right, in grand redemption. Uh, God would do this work for them. All right, so then we move to the next section, which is the person of redemption. Redemption. 
And by the way, we see the break there from verse 22 of verse, uh, chapter 48. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. That seems to be a, a division in the, uh, the various sections of this book of comfort. Anyway, in, in, in verse chapter 49, we see uh, the Messiah's calling. We see God's remembrance of his people. The servant is specifically mentioned again. This time, the prophecy, you might notice, being in the first person. Listen, O coastlands, to me. The Lord has called me from the womb. My mother. This is in the first person now. Uh, God had an eternal calling for this servant, verse 1. He had a specific purpose for this servant in verse 2. But the servant actually stands, seems to be here in the place of Israel, in whom God will be glorified. And we see that here in verse 49, verse 3. He said to me, you are my servant, O Israel. So I said before, there are some times that it seems to be the reference to the nation. Sometimes the servant seems to be referenced to a specific person. Here it does seem to go either way. Though it says in verse 3 about the nation of Israel, it is still a reference to a person as we see in verse 6. Because this person is called to not just redeem Israel, but to redeem Israel and be given as a light to the Gentiles. Look at verse 6. Indeed, it's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Okay, how could the servant be Israel right at that point if he's raising up the tribes of Israel, raising up the tribes of Jacob? So we have this reference here that's the same term used for two different things. One's a reference to the nation, one's a reference to the person here. But are you too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So here's a specific person, this servant of God raised up for this glorious purpose. God's redemption is continued to be proclaimed and his covenant promises to God are reiterated, to Israel rather, those are reiterated. God would not forget his people, but he wouldn't forget all the people around the world. He sent his servant to redeem all of these people. Specifically for Israel, they were inscribed on the palms of his hands in verse 16, perhaps a reference to the nail prints and the wrists of Jesus. We also notice that the nation would be laid waste, but eventually the nations of the earth would come and bow down to that of Israel in verse 23. Chapter 50, God's power to redeem, we see here. The voice of God, the voice of the servant, again, talking about the person of God's redemption, uh, seem to be somewhat interchangeable here, which is appropriate considering Jesus is God. It makes sense that they'd be interchangeable. On one hand, we see in verse 2 that God shows himself again to be the Redeemer. He takes that uh, title is to himself, is my hand short in verse 2, at all that it cannot redeem. So God is speaking here. On the other hand, specific prophecy is given of his servant who's going to be rejected and beaten and have his beard plucked out in verses 5 and 6. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. We know that's directly a promise of Jesus right there. So the servant would suffer, but he'd still be helped by the Lord. And in the process, this servant invites all people everywhere to trust in the name of the Lord, verse 10. God's promise to redeem is seen in chapters 51 and 52. Over and over again, God appeals to Israel to listen to his voice and awaken from their slumber. Three times we see the phrase, listen to me. Three times in this section we see the phrase, awake, awake. God's making a point. He's appealing to his people. He's always reaching out to his people that they might be saved. This nation had sold itself for nothing, as we see in chapter 52, verse 3. But he says you should be redeemed without money. He proclaimed that he would bring peace and salvation in verse 7. <laughs> and this message was beautiful, right? He's the one who brought the gospel. Look at verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And again, this is still the message that we proclaim. This is still the great commission that we're called to do. This is the gospel that we preach to the end of the earth. This is what has been entrusted to us as the church, and it's beautiful news to those who need to hear. Chapter 52, though, it ends by focusing once more on the servant of God, this time looking at his terrible suffering, something that's only expanded upon in chapter 53. That takes us to the famous suffering servant. This is one of the greatest and most sublime chapters of Jesus in all the Old Testament. Verses 1, 4, 
5, 7, 9, and 12 are all quoted specifically through the Gospels. It's referenced in detail in 1 Peter. The scope of this chapter is huge. Specific prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus' suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection. His substitutionary atonement seen as is the predestined counsel of God. I see Isaiah 53 as a mountaintop among the Scriptures which you see both the glory and the suffering of Christ. Verse 3, Jesus is despised and rejected. The servant who is sent by God is rejected by his own people. In verse 4, Jesus is smitten not just by Gentiles, but smitten by God himself. This is God's wrath poured out on him. Verses 5 and 6, we see him being the substitute in his suffering and his death. He's propitiation for our sin, just like those ancient sacrifices were, so is Jesus. He's the ultimate sacrifice. Verses 7 through 8, he's silent in his death. He could have spoken up for himself, but he didn't. He went there as a willing servant in all humility. Verse 8, we see that Jesus is unique in burial. He was dying among the wicked, buried with the rich. We see that specifically uh, fulfilled when he died between two thieves, and he was buried in a rich man's tomb. In verse 9, we see that he was absolutely sinless. He's innocent. There was no deceit in his mouth. He had done no violence. He had done nothing wrong. Despite all the times they accused him of being a Sabbath breaker, he hadn't done it. He perfectly fulfilled the law. Verses 10 and 11, we find that this was the plan of God. It perfectly accomplished the will of God. He says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. It was done. It was over. It was finished. Our sins have been justified in Christ, forever laid to rest. And of course, verse 12, Jesus is forever glorified because of his obedient work, his sacrifice. You know, Isaiah 53, when you look at this honestly, it ought to satisfy any skeptic that Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of prophecy. If you had no other prophecy, no other book of the Bible that prophesied of Jesus, just looking at Isaiah 53 and the life of Jesus, that ought to be enough. Remember that this was the chapter that brought the Ethiopian eunuch to faith in Acts chapter 8. Still brings people to faith today. We just showed people how Jesus fulfilled prophecy. It's a shining light through history that this is the one in whom we ought to trust. After chapter 53, of course, chapter 54, there's glory after the suffering. As a result of the suffering of God's servant, the blessings come, the nation can break out into song. We see that in verse 1. The Redeemer has shown himself to be the Holy One of Israel. Again, we see God tying that together for himself. That's his favorite title throughout Isaiah. The nation had been punished, but they would be brought back. They'd be glorified. And this picture is really fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. And we see it in verses 11 through 13. There's these foundations of sapphires, pinnacles of rubies, gates of crystal. Of course, that wasn't done when they came back from Babylonian exodus or captivity. It wasn't done there. It's only going to be done in the millennial kingdom. Right? So chapter 55, we get this invitation to partake in redemption. The whole world is invited to drink of these waters. Verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to those waters. Come, buy, and eat. We're invited to come into the everlasting covenant of David through the work of the Messiah, as we see in verse 3. I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. All the world, by the way, invited to partake in the mercies of David. How is that? Because Jesus is the son of David, so even Gentiles can participate in the Davidic covenant because our faith is in Jesus. So what are we to do? Well, we're to respond. Look at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. We call upon the Lord while we've got the opportunity to do so. We've been invited. When you feel the Lord moving on your heart, you are to respond. Love verses 8 and 9. They're very famous in Isaiah. They're actually quoted out of context many times. Look at that briefly. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh, many times we'll quote these verses when we're trying to understand the plan of God, which is so often unknowable. Uh, let's be honest, so many times it is beyond us, and that's true. But I'd suggest that the original context of these verses is far much better than what we actually take it for many times. Because Isaiah just appealed to the people to seek the Lord to repentance, find Him while He might be found, with the promise that God would indeed pardon. That was a whole idea here. And afterwards, we see that God promises His Word won't return void. It does bear fruit. In other words, 
the fruit of salvation for those who believe. So what's God saying in verses 8 and 9 about his ways being higher than our ways, thoughts being higher than our thoughts? He's speaking of his plan to save. That's what he's speaking of here. He's referring to his plan to reach out to the nations of the world with the gospel. And so far more than theorizing about the plan of God to which we may or may not be understand, really this is speaking of the incomprehensible goodness of God right here. God is so good that his goodness is beyond our understanding. How do you know it? Because he's even planned to redeem people like us. No one of us would do that, but God does. That's amazing. Verse, or chapter 56, 1 through 8. This is God's promise to the Gentiles. And once more, we see that it's not just God's plan to redeem Israel, but he extends his offer of peace and redemption to the whole world. Look at verse 8. All the nations of the world are invited to be gathered to him, partake in the gospel. Uh, but we do see God's knowledge of Israel uh, from the rest of 56 into chapter 57. Uh, the present time, of course, we've been speaking so much in the millennial kingdom, the promises yet to come in the Messiah. That was still in the future here for Isaiah, but there was a present problem of Judah's sin, and God was keenly aware of that. And again, I mentioned that there is some overlap here. There is some mention of judgment, and that comes out here. The leaders of the people took the people into idolatry, and God's already condemned idolatry several times before. They'd taken the people there, but they didn't have to stay there. They may have been backslidden, but they could return to the Lord. Anyone could, as it says in verse 57, 15. Anyone who had a humble spirit, right? A contrite spirit. The wicked would have no peace. But those who repented could find grace. Well, it takes us to the next section here. The final salvation and judgment starting in chapter 58. First he talks about true fasting. Fasting for the Jews had degenerated talking about all this idolatry, all this false religion that had crept in. Well, some true aspects of religion got corrupted as well, fasting being one of them. And they were fasting and degenerated into something that was ritualistic. It wasn't real. It was superficial, not sincere. And the people wondered why. You know, God seemingly, at verse 3, they took no notice of them. I did all this fasting just as I thought I was supposed to do according to my tradition. Well, how come God's not answering the way that I think he ought to act? Well, because God knew their lack of modems, and God called them to do something that was more than just ritual. He called them to put real action with their fast, and he describes what he's looking for in verses 6 and 8. Uh, Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free? that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you save the naked, that you cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh. And it goes on from there. See, to rebellious Judah, he invited them to do more than just go through the motions of fasting, but to go through acts of repentance and to demonstrate it with their lives. And this hasn't changed today. Speaks of sincerity in our relationship with God. It's not that prayer and fasting is bad. Of course, it's not as a great thing. But it ought never be alone. What good is repentance from our lips if we don't ever have repentance through our actions? God was indeed willing to lead and to guide Judah, as we see here in verses 11 through 14. But they ought to also have delighted themselves in truth to the Lord, as do we. Well, chapter 59 talking about this sin, all was committed, it was confessed, and God dealt with it. He redeemed it. God plainly calls the Jews out on their sin. The people, they were separated from God because they were defiled, as it says in verses 2 through 3. Your iniquities have separated you from God. That's all what's, always what sin does. It separates us from his presence. And God details the wickedness of the people and how they rushed to shed innocent blood, it says in verse 7. Isaiah speaks up on their behalf prophetically. Verses 9 through 15, on their behalf, he confesses their sin. Notice the first person that he says there, therefore justice is far from us, we look for light. So Isaiah is speaking on their behalf there. Now in response, God acts in a marvelous way, because uh, Isaiah prophesies how God brought forth his own righteousness through the spirit-empowered redeemer servant of the Lord. Look at verses 15 through uh, 20. The Lord saw and it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16, therefore his own arm brought salvation for him. It was his own righteousness and it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and helmet as a salvation on his head. 
So this servant is clothed in the same armor of God that Paul writes about in Ephesians chapter 6. And through the work of the Redeemer, that mighty work, God's people are once again the treasure of God. They speak the word of God, as it says in verse 21. Now we see so much here in verse 59. We just don't have time to get into it today in chapter 59. How this so describes the life of a New Testament Christian in a nutshell, because on one hand, we understand the reality of our sin, how it separates us from God and brings us into interrupted fellowship, interrupted relationship, but is brought to light by the Word of God. He reveals it to us. There's confession on our part. As we repent, we place ourselves into the mercies of Jesus and His promises. And then there is the promise of the work of Jesus, the Redeemer sent by God, empowered by God, glorified by God, and through Him we become the people of God, treasuring His people, treasuring His promise. Chapter 60, the Gentiles give glory to God. God has revealed much to Isaiah about the future redemption of the Jewish people, but once more, he reminds the prophets that the the plan of God is much, much bigger than Israel and extends to every tribe and every tongue. There's coming a day where God's glory is going to be known all over the earth, as it says in verse 2, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. God's uh, millennial kingdom is when this is going to be truly fulfilled, partially fulfilled, of course, in Jesus' first coming. We see this in Matthew when it's talking about how a light has been arisen, come out of Zebulun and been seen among the, the Gentiles here. But it's truly fulfilled in the millennial kingdom when Jesus visibly reigns over all the earth. And just as God shows Isaiah here, people from every nation are going to come and rejoice in the presence of the Christ King, as we see in verses 4 through 9, that being described there. The future city of the king will once again be Zion, as we see in verse 14. They'll come bowing to you. They'll call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. They literally come to a literal city. The king spoken of as once being hated and rejected and forsaken, but now being victorious, as it says in verse 15. Obviously speaking of the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Chapter 60 goes on to describe much more of the millennial kingdom, but it also describes the eternal state as well. In fact, if you just kind of glance over those um, language in the, the closing verses here, verses 19 through 20, uh, so much of this is reflected in the closing chapters of Revelation, being in that eternal presence of God. The sun's no longer to be the light by day. It's the Lord that is the everlasting light. God is your glory. So Isaiah, again, looking far into the future. Chapter 61 We're making progress, guys. We're going to get to this tonight. Chapter 61, we see the spirit-empowered ministry of Messiah. Much of Isaiah's writings have been messianic, of course, particularly as we saw in chapter 53. We saw it in chapter uh, 61 here at the beginning as well. This section of Scripture right here is the section that Jesus picked up in the synagogue to read from and tell the people that was fulfilled. Remember what it said in Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened up the book, he found the place where it was written. We pick it up here from chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then it says in Luke 4, then he closed the book gave it to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. No ambiguity there, is there? (laughs) If Jesus says that this scripture is about him and that it's fulfilled, then guess what? That's exactly what it is. This gives this first few verses of chapter 61, this gives the essence of the gospel message of the kingdom. You've got the spiritual healing. You've got the liberty from spiritual slavery. You've got the comfort of God and so much more. Now that said, chapter 61 doesn't just speak of Jesus' first coming. He said it was fulfilled in their hearing, partially fulfilled, but it also still looks forward to the millennial kingdom and his second coming because you go past those verses. We see his first coming there, but you go down to verse 4. Well, that's not first coming anymore. Verse 4 is second coming. They'll rebuild the old ruins. They'll raise up former desolations, and it goes on from that point. The Jewish people are going to be named the priests of God, verse 6. They're going to have a double portion of the land, verse 7. God promises to honor his covenant with the people, verse 8. All the people everywhere are going to rejoice in him, verse 10. 
God has made these promises to his people and he's going to fulfill them. Chapter 62, he gives a promise to exalt Zion. Once more, God specifically states his future plans for Zion. And Zion is contrasted here with the Gentiles. And again, the city is speaking of in literal terms. In fact, we see it specifically in verses 8 and 9 because it's talking about grain and wine. No longer will I give your grain as food for the enemies. Sons of the foreigners shall not drink your new wine. Uh, for all the, those who, who want to try to spiritualize these verses away, it's very difficult to do that when you're talking about literal economic transactions like this. God is rebuilding a literal city. It's going to find its fulfillment again in the millennium. You can't spiritualize this away without doing much damage to the text. When God promises that his salvation is coming to the daughter of Zion, verse 11, then that's exactly what he means. Chapter 63 and 64, God's glorious mercy scene. Now first we see God coming in his glorious fury, but understand that his judgment at this point in the text is not against his people, but it was for their salvation. Look at 63 verse 5. I looked, but there was no one to help. I wondered, there's no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury it sustained me, trod down the people in his anger, made them drunk in fury, brought their strength down to the earth. God is working on behalf of his people, on behalf of the nation. He's talking about the loyal, loving kindness that he has for his people, verse 7. They had been rebellious in the past, but God dealt with their sin. There had been a time when God allowed the adversaries of the Jews to take over the holy sanctuary, as we see in verse 18. Their adversaries had trodden down the sanctuary then. But God's people remembered his promise. And they pleaded with God to return, and they even confess their own sin back to God in graphic terms. And this picture still stands, us, stands out to us today. Verse 6 of chapter 64. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. This is still the terribleness of sin. It's filthy. It's unclean. It's bloody. And even the best that we think we can bring to God, that's not good enough. It's all unclean. But even in this, God's people knew they could still call upon him. They knew that he was their father. He was the potter. They were but the clay. They knew that God would not be angry with them forever. As it says in verse 9, Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. They could trust that they were still his people. Well, God gives glorious judgment in chapter 65. Once more, God makes it known that he's aware of the sin of the people. God never ignores sin. He deals with it, thankfully, has dealt with in full through Jesus. It was the people who were not called by his name that had sought him out in verse 1, as we see. His own people were hypocritical. They were the ones that, in fact, this is where we get the term from, verse 5, holier than you, holier than thou. A hypocritical worship. They were acting in idolatry. And God made it clear that he would bring righteous judgment, but it would be to a remnant of his elect that would inherit the promises. Verse 9, who would it go to? This elect, what would go to them? Well, this new creation. Chapter 65, verse 17 through 25, beyond the time of judgments comes a time of blessing. The old is gone as we see in verse 17. A new heaven and a new earth is promised by God. The millennial kingdom is described as a time when the death of a person who's 100 years old would be considered the death of a child, verse 20. And once more, this is a time that's described as you know, the wolf and the lamb feeding together in peace in verse 25. Might ask a question. We say, well, there's things here that seem to be mixed again. How can the reader distinguish between the things of the millennial kingdom and the things of the eternal state? And it is difficult to be sure because the two periods do seem to intermingle here in this chapter quite a bit. You know, on the one hand, we read of people dying. And we know that will happen during the millennial time, but it won't happen during the eternal state. But on the other hand, the text is clear about a new heaven and a new earth coming, and we know that doesn't happen until the eternal state, uh, right after that thousand-year kingdom has ended. And again, this is an example of the mountain peaks of prophecy, and this is one of these areas where it can seem like it's all mixed together and the, the near stage when really it's separated here by literally a thousand years at this point. And so to put it in the right context, this is where we have to bring in the context of the rest of the Scripture and compare Scripture with Scripture and come up with the right interpretation.
Uh, that's one reason we have to let our interpretations be guided by the Scripture and not by our tradition, because otherwise we can come up with a very wrong interpretation here, spiritualize these things away. But in any case, the point's clear that God has a plan for His people beyond the judgment that He was bringing. God would judge, but that's not all God would do. He had a plan to bless His people, to shower them with grace. And guess what? We get to enjoy that same blessing, right? Right now. We don't have to wait until that time the millennial kingdom. We can enjoy that relationship with God right now. And so then chapter 66, I told you we would get there tonight. God promised to return and to judge. Now God does affirm his, his superiority over the temple and all the sacrifices. Verse 1, verse 3. He affirmed in regards to fasting. God saw past all of that superficial ritual that they were doing. He saw the hearts of the people who truly worshipped him. Verse 2. And it was to those worshipers God reiterates His promise to deliver them from their enemies. God promised a time of immense blessing and peace. We see in verse 12. Promises a time that people would rejoice in Him. Verse 14. All the nations of the world would witness God's blessing upon Israel. And doesn't this sound familiar? Because we just said it a few chapters earlier. Verse 23. That every knee would bow. All flesh would come to worship God. Now, as we see as it ends here in verse 24, for those who choose to rebel, their corpses remain in the place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Interesting way to end the book, isn't it? It is the book of comfort in the book of Isaiah, but it ends on a pretty sober note of judgment. God does promise to save and bless all those who come to worship Him, whether they be Jew or Gentile, but there will always be those people who make the choice uh, not to worship God. You know, being born a Jew is no guarantee of salvation, just like being born a Gentile is no guarantee of damnation. It all depends on how we respond to re the Redeemer, the servant of God, God Himself. When Jesus reveals Himself to us, how do we respond to Him? Do we partake of that substitutionary sacrifice? Humble ourselves with those true acts of repentance and turning to the Lord, or do we maintain a superficial false spirituality? never really worshiping God in truth. Isaiah here makes it clear that God extends his salvation to the world. All we need to do is respond to him for it. So this is a promise of redemption. The book of judgment saw God being sovereign over all the events of the world. He knew all the sin of the world, both among his people and among the Gentiles, and gives hints of redemption. And all of that is grandly portrayed in the book of judgment. There God acts as the redeemer, both sending His servant, Jesus, to suffer and shed His blood for our sin, and also to return as the reigning King who will rule the whole earth. God's people are redeemed from their sin. We have a promised future of dwelling with our Redeemer. What a promise. What a future. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for this book. I thank You for how it so clearly portrays Christ. I thank You, Lord, for Your promises which are true your deliverance which is sure. And I pray, Lord, that we would take comfort in those things. That we would remember that we will dwell in eternity with you. All those who trust you by faith will dwell in eternity with you. There's no doubt. You are the living God and you are good to every word. Thank you how you painted yourself this picture of being the one who redeems. We were in need of redemption and you did it. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.